So our final general session speaker for NITOP 2024 is Dr. Morton Ann Gernsbacher. Dr. Gernsbacher's appearance is sponsored by the Society of Teaching of, for the Teaching of Psychology, Division II of APA. We really appreciate uh, their continued sponsorship. Dr. Gernsbacher is the Villas Research Professor and the Sir Frederick C. Bartlett Professor of Psychology, the University of Wisconsin at Madison. She began her career as a high school teacher and volunteer research assistant, uh, and she received her PhD from the University of Texas working with Don Foss, who is here. So that's great uh, to have that reunion. Um, Dr. Gernsbacher has had a prolific and distinguished career in both research and teaching. She is a long time friend of, of, of NITOP and STP. Her primary area of research is cognitive and neural mechanisms that underlie human communication. She's a past president of APS and a former chair of the Board of Scientific Affairs for APA. In terms of teaching, she's probably best known uh, for the, as the creator of several online courses, one of which is on research methods and another on the effects of the internet, uh, uh, the effects of, of the internet which she freely shares with other teachers. Today, she'll address us on ChatGPT and our classes, Dr. Gernsbacher. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Thank you for joining me here today to think about ChatGPT and our classes. First, just a few highlights or notes about me. As Steve mentioned, I'm Morton Gernsbacher. I'm at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm one of those, I believe, many professors at large flagship R1 universities who care as much about teaching as they do about research and service. Um, as I, Steve mentioned, I began my career teaching high school Spanish and English. Hence, some of you might appreciate my love for the five paragraph essay. And then I was later introduced to research and I found that research was a perfect complement to my teaching and service. So I'm one of those research loving teachers or maybe it's teaching loving researchers I really don't think we have to be one or the other. As Steve mentioned, I currently teach three courses, undergraduate research methods, about which I presented at NITOP undergraduate basic stats, and a upper division undergraduate course called Psychological Effects of the Internet. All my enrollments are around 200 students per course, and I have one TA for every 70 to 100 students. I wanted to mention that just to give you a bit of background about myself. And then for the rest of our time together, here's what's going to happen. First, I'm gonna present a brief 20 minute overview of ChatGPT, what it is, what it can be used for, and why it has caused both widespread applause and widespread alarm. Then I'm gonna describe how some instructors are using ChatGPT to facilitate their workload and after that, I'll share some ideas for how you might facilitate students in your course using ChatGPT. And then lastly, I hope we'll have 15 minutes for open discussion and questions. So let's jump in. I suspect many of us remember the headlines that blared across the country barely a year ago. Why tech insiders are so excited about ChatGPT, a chatbot that answers questions and writes essays. And that was from CNBC, the Consumer News and Business Channel. AI bot ChatGPT stuns academics with essay writing skills and usability. And that was from the UK newspaper, The Guardian. Could this be the future of teaching and journalism? And that was from the World Economic Forum. Are AI writing tools just assistance or something more? From Entrepreneur Magazine. Point of view, with ChatGPT's arrival, should educators be mourning the end of the college essay? And that was from Boston University Today. Opinion, the college essay is not dead. And that was from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. The college essay is still very much alive. That was from Forbes Magazine. AI will augment, not replace. And that was from Inside Higher Ed. Could ChatGPT mark, meaning grade, your students' essays? And that was from TES Magazine. AI writing tools could hand scientists the gift of time 
That was from the elite scientific journal, Nature. And then back to the Chronicle of Higher Education, why I'm not scared of ChatGPT. So, well, what is ChatGPT? It's a large language learning model that produces human-like text. It was launched on November 30th, 2022, and by December 5th, less than a week later, it had already gained one million users. It was created by OpenAI, which is a US-based artificial intelligence research laboratory. And as one of my colleagues always likes to point out, the company's name is OpenAI, it's not free AI. And that's because although the basic ChatGPT, currently called ChatGPT 3.5, is free to users, it's unlikely to remain free. In fact, it's currently costing OpenAI an estimated $3 million a day to simply run the freebie version. And that explains why OpenAI has already introduced a paid version called ChatGPT Plus, which for $20 a month provides general access to ChatGPT even during peak times and faster response times. In my view, even the freebie version is, still pr is already pretty fast. So how fast? Well, as Eric Fournier, who's the Director of Educational Development at Washington University in St. Louis tweeted back in January 2023, I asked ChatGPT to write a 300-word strategic plan for a major research university. It took 10 seconds. Today, we don't have time to read through the strategic plan, but it's really good. I mean, meaning it's something any of us would likely read as a strategic plan for a major research university. I mean, it's pretty generic, but then again, so are most strategic plans. What else can ChatGPT do? How many of you have to take a cyber, se cyber security awareness training? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every year at your institution. I do at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and it's a mandated policy for all employees and students. And to document that we've completed the training, we have to answer 15 multiple choice questions. ChatGPT can answer all 15 questions correctly in about two seconds. Here's some other things that ChatGPT can do, as itemized in a Twitter thread by Allie K. Miller back in December of 2022. Ask it to write basic computer programming scripts or even more qualitative questions like, what is the most efficient way to loop through a list in Python? Copy and paste an article and ask, can you summarize this article in one paragraph in the way that a fifth grader could understand it? In other words, ChatGPT can channel Michael Scott, AKA Steve Carell, from the US TV show, The Office. Why don't you explain this to me why I'm angry? And that, you can ask it. I'm turning 40, year old soon, 40 years old soon, and I want to celebrate my birthday in a way that incorporates my passions. I love barbecue and ax throwing. What are three ideas for a party that costs under 2K? You can ask, write a nice email to Tom, ask him if he enjoyed the offsite, then ask him to visit to update his monthly report. Use that as a foundation, then edit or tweak as needed. However, as Vanderbilt University learned back in February 2023, it's best to follow Allie Miller's advice and definitely edit and tweak the output as needed, because otherwise you're gonna wake up to headlines like this one from the UK Guardian newspaper. Vanderbilt apologizes for using ChatGPT in email on the Michigan campus st shooting. And the telltale sign that the Vanderbilt campus-wide email message was written by ChatGPT, the sentence quote from OpenAI's ChatGPT language model that appeared at the bottom of the campus-wide email message. But more positively, consider this Reddit post written by an anonymous undergraduate student at an unknown university. I've been reading in this subreddit and on the internet at large about how AI will lead to mass unemployment. However, in my case, it has made me a much better student. For me, Google, YouTube, textbooks were hard. It would be so easy for me to get hung up on a difficult concept or get distracted by all the ads and notifications that Google sends. What ChatGPT has given me 
is the ability to learn the best way I can by having a conversation. I find it easier to learn with ChatGPT because I can treat it like my personal tutor. It allows me to ask for a clarification and get a deeper understanding of concepts. As a sidebar, let me mention that one study has reported that 90% of students prefer having ChatGPT as their personal tutor compared with a human tutor or even their teacher. The speculative reason is that students feel ChatGPT won't judge them, or at least will judge them less harshly than a human, and therefore students feel more freedom to share ideas that they're not 100% certain about, or even just make mistakes. So, but back to our student reporting anonymously on Reddit, I'm also able to read and to do homework more efficiently by using ChatGPT to help me understand dense textbook material. This ChatGPT advantage is also illustrated by, closer at least to my home, a tweet from Benjamin Douglas, who's a UW-Madison PhD student in my department and one of my former TAs. He tweeted, ChatGPT just helped me solve a statistical analysis problem in about one hour that I didn't know how I'd even approach four days ago. Honestly, very impressed. Similarly, a Stanford neuroscientist, Russ Poldrock, tweeted, I seem to have blown my students' minds today in my stats class by telling them that they need to learn how to use ChatGPT, Copilot, et cetera, to write computer code, since hardly anyone will be writing computer code de novo in the near future. Learning to edit an AI's code is great training, to which Eco Fried responded very teasingly as though he was quoting someone in the future, reflecting back on what we people did way, way back before the year 2023. You did what? No way. For every single email you wrote? Not really? From scratch? You started in an empty blank document and you typed every word? Already instructors are using ChatGPT so that they are not starting from scratch. As illustrated by this Facebook comment, I've been asking ChatGPT for classroom activity ideas using certain topics and to help me think about intersections between various different research interests that I have. It's been fun to explore, honestly, to which Alexandria Maria replied, loving ChatGPT for my courses helped me write up course overview, expectations, and class introductions. So how does it work? Well, it would take more than the precious hour that we have here today to work through all the nuts and bolts about ChatGPT and all other large language learning models. And there are many of them. I mean, referring to the brand name ChatGPT is like referring to the brand name Kleenex when we really just mean tissue. But in a nutshell, ChatGPT and all other large language models are first trained on, as the name implies, large language sets. And then they interact with us through prediction in the same way that our smartphones and laptops offer us predictive text when we're writing a text message or a document, in the same way that Amazon and other retailers offer us shopping recommendations, in the same way that our security cameras alert us when our kids, rather than unknown intruders, have entered our home, in the same way that Spotify and other music streaming apps offer us music playlist recommendations, same way that those customer service chat bots answer our questions, and I confess I've finally learned, grown to like them. But what makes ChatGPT so powerful is captured by the following tweet by Lila Glass. A quick calculation I hadn't seen. If you read a novel, 10,000 K words a day, for every day for 80 years, you would have read 2.92 billion words in your lifetime. That's less than 1% of the 300 billion words on which ChatGPT was trained. And that's what we mean by large language learning models. 
very large language learning models. Now keep in mind, however, that those 300 billion words on which a large language learning model like ChatGPT has been trained manifest all the biases that our previous literary sources embodied. And that is a problem. It's a big problem. But it's that language training in general that allows ChatGPT and other large language learning models to work the same way as our longtime friends, like spell checking and grammar checking. They too work off of prediction. And although these days most all of us educators are comfortable with our students using spell checking and grammar checking, in fact, we might encourage it, I definitely do, that hasn't always been the case. I've been teaching at the university level long enough to remember when spell checkers caused a moral panic among educators who decried that if we allow students to use spell checkers, they'll never learn how to spell. Now spell checkers are promoted by educators, not only for cleaning up students' writing, but also the data show that they help teach students how to spell. I'm also old enough to remember when even the humble pencil eraser caused a moral panic. When I was in grade school, we weren't allowed to have erasers on our pencils until third grade. The fear was that if a student had access to an eraser, they'd be more inclined to make mistakes. And we don't want students making mistakes. So as grade school students, we were given big red eraserless pencils. And I'm looking for other boomers in the audience to back me up here. You might have experienced it as well. Quote, this classic American pencil was made in Tennessee for decades and was considered a kindergarten classic. Its large diameter made it especially easy to write with and perfect for little hands, unquote. The moral panic over allowing students to have access to erasers subsided, at least I think by the time I taught high school. But these, in fact, these days, I'm unable to find any large diameter pencils perfect for little hands that don't have erasers. They all seem to come with erasers. But when I looked on eBay, using a search term vintage, I found antique, but well-preserved packs of those erasorless pencils that I was forced to use when I was in grade school. Here they're called beginner's pencils, vintage beginner's pencils. And this particular set was produced, by schools, uh, produced for schools across Louisiana, hence the LA school's insignia. My guess is that these big red eraserless pencils were common beyond the South because they are referenced in author Dale's autobiography titled Growing Up in Bridgeport, Illinois in the 40s and 50s. Dale writes in one of the very first chapters, the first morning at school, we were given a mimeograph sheet and a fat pencil with no eraser. The sheet had several rows of pictures. All the pictures in a given row were identical except for one which had something missing. We were to circle with the fat pencil with no eraser the picture with the missing part in each row. In using my left hand to hold my paper steady, I accidentally covered part of one picture with my thumb. That picture looked different, so I circled it. I quickly saw that I had made a mistake and hurriedly circled the actual picture with the missing part. Since the fat pencil had no eraser, I tried to erase it with spit and my fingernail, but that didn't work. Sidebar, I, Morton, vividly remember doing almost the exact same thing, also almost on the very first day of school, the spit plus fingernail approach. That's because I'd put an extra S on the spelling test word Dallas. I mean, it has two L's, and for symmetry, I just thought it would look better with two S's, but uh, I thought better, and then I tried this spit plus fingernail, ersatz, and it didn't work either. Back to Arthur Dale. I sat at my desk watching my teacher go to each desk to check the work. I was in the last row, and by the time she got to me, I had worked up a sweat from worry. I explained to her how I had made the mistake. I showed her I knew the correct response. She just looked at me and then put a big red X in the margin by the row. When I went home at noon, my mother asked me how I liked school. I said I didn't like it, and I hid my paper with the big red X. 
In current day, I'm delighted to see that all the best-selling beginner's pencils on Amazon come with erasers. So the moral panic about early writers using erasers, I hope, is a thing of the past. When I taught high school in the early 1970s, I had a front row seat for another moral panic, the moral panic about pocket calculators. Although I wasn't teaching math, the clamor over students allowed to use pocket calculators, which had only recently become household items, became so fever pitch that everyone in the school was aware of the controversy. The following progression of article titles in the journal The Arithmetic Teacher, which is the house organ of the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, illustrates national math teachers' position shifting from asking hand calculators, where do you stand, to suggesting one point of view, the hand calculator, handheld calculator, to making a case for the calculator, to cheerleading, let's do it, taking advantage of the hand calculator, to arguing that when you use a calculator, you have to think, to summarizing how research gives calculators a green light to settling on the position that the calculator is a problem-solving concept developer that should not only be included in all math curricula, but also introduced to early math learners, which really fired up the moral panic. Protests ensued. Here are a sample of some of the protest signs that said things such as, I don't want my fifth grader using a calculator. Students need arithmetic skills, not calculators. Brains, not buttons. <laughs> and one of the protesters interviewed for a newspaper article reported concerns eerily similar to those I've heard about students using chat GPT. Quote, kids don't pay attention to an answer being absurd. They don't look at it. It's on the calculator, so it must be right. This protester also went so far as to say that students were addicted to calculators and called those students calculholics. <laughs> 50 years down the pike, don't we wish that students were spending that much time calculating? <laughs> but undoubtedly the concern that has least well stood the test of time was the concern that we shouldn't rely on pocket calculators because we won't always have one in our pocket. <laughs> really. As I mentioned before, I teach an upper division course called Psychological Effects of the Internet. And in the first unit of my course, we trace nearly 20 of these technological and pastime moral panics, including chess, which these days is considered a quite brainy pastime but back in the 19th century, chess was considered a supreme waste of time and a horrible distraction for young boys. A an 1859 article in Scientific American claimed that playing chess, quote, robs the mind of the valuable time that might be devoted to nobler acquirements. Recurring concerns were that playing chess was physically sedentary, highly addictive, and that only the most elite chess players could ever make a living from it, which sounds a lot like our current day concerns about video games. Even novels, and in particular, young women reading novels, caused a moral panic in the 1700s. Novels were believed to inspire elopement, even prostitution, because we don't want to give young women any romantic ideas. Going back farther in time, we can see the moral panic about an advancement that we all rely heavily on in current day, writing. Socrates proclaimed that writing would weaken students' minds because students would falsely rely on the written word, and therefore students would have, quote, the appearance of wisdom not with its reality that students would, quote, put their trust in writing, which depends on signs that belong to others, meaning that students would rely on others' work rather than doing the work themselves, which, of course, sounds very familiar. Thus, as Nate Holdren tweeted a year ago, December, is the AI writing essay thing a full-blown moral panic yet? 
Either way, what's going on with that? Like, what's behind it? Feels like a reboot of a show I've seen before and seen reboots of and didn't like. But I'd like a better grasp of why it keeps getting recommissioned. One of my favorite responses to Holdren's tweet was this tongue-in-cheek tweet from the real Steve Mang. Conspiracy theory I just made up. The college board is behind it trying to convince universities that dropping the SAT and GRE requirements that you can't trust grades based on assignments that could have been done with AI only in person standardized tests are acceptable. But beyond these transitory moral panics, there are some true concerns about ChatGPT and other generative AI models. As I mentioned a moment ago, because ChatGPT and other AI models were trained on existing literature, they have learned all the biases and stereotypes that existed in that previous literature. For example, in a study reported by Scientific American titled ChatGPT Replicates Gender Bias in Recommendation Letters, researchers asked two large model, language large, large language learning models, ChatGPT and Alpaca, a model developed by Stanford University, to produce recommendation letters for hypothetical employees. While ChatGPT deployed nouns such as expert and integrity for men, it was more likely to call women a beauty or delight. Alpaca had similar problems. Men were listeners and thinkers, and women had grace and beauty. Adjectives proved similarly polarized. Men were respectful, reputable, and authentic, according to ChatGPT, while women were stunning, warm, and emotional. Thus, it is a problem that ChatGPT and other large learn language learning models reify these biases and stereotypes that existed in our previous literature. ChatGPT has also been accused of being exploitative. As reported by many news sources, workers in Kenya were tasked with pruning ChatGPT of, quote, graphic text, including des describing scenes of murder, bestiality, and rape unquote. And the Kenyan workers were paid very low wages for doing that. In addition, as the New York Times reported just last week, journalists as well as authors have joined in a suit arguing that ChatGPT and other AI models were trained on copyrighted information, and the plaintiffs argue that that use goes well beyond fair use. These ills aside, what can ChatGPT do for you? Well, my presentation today is sponsored by the Society for Teaching of Psychology, STP, and I serve as STP's Vice President of Grants and Awards. As Steve mentioned, STP was founded as Division II of, the, uh, of APA, but you don't have to be a member of APA to join STP. The dues are only $25 a year for teachers, and uh, for students, it's $15 a year. STP runs a vibrant Facebook group, and you don't even have to be a member of STP to join the public STP Facebook group. But to me, it's kind of like belonging to PBS. It's just kind of a nice thing to do. In the STP Facebook group, you're able to ask and answer a myriad of teaching-related questions, such as, hi, everyone. Would you happen to know any source for research method exams questions? I've been teaching research methods for some time now, and I think I need some fresh exam questions, preferably a multiple choice. To which a community member answered, I don't mean to be snarky at all, but ChatGPT writes some mean questions. I even tell it the level the questions should be. Another community member answered, ChatGPT and Bard write nice questions. However, another community member cautioned, watch out for ChatGPT test questions. They've gotten worse throughout the year. I haven't used it for stats, but for general psychology, I noticed that it started writing questions where the correct answer was obvious due to either wording, length, or both. So the notion is checking, checking ChatGPT for accuracy, and I think that's paramount. And I'm going to discuss more about that and how we should train students to do the same in a moment, but I think it's just that's kind of our basic 101, is to apply critical thinking whenever we're putting together uh, teaching materials. Here's another example. Another community member asked um, the STP Facebook group, 
What technology apps do you use to make your job easier or better? And a lot of, although a lot of the community members chimed in with the answer Perusal, which is very popular as we all know, many others chimed in with the following. I've used ChatGPT to help me flesh out rubric descriptions. With some brain power, they can be really informative, to which the original poster asked, curious to know more about this. And the answer, I literally ask it to generate a rubric for whatever the assignment is. You can specify if there are certain categories you want to include and how many levels for each it should have. A few revisions back and forth, and you should have something fairly usable. Another community member responded to the initial question in this way, I've used ChatGPT to generate exam or quiz questions, especially multiple choice, because sometimes it's so hard to come up with three wrong answers. Obviously, it's important to make sure the questions align with what was taught, but I've had great success and saved a ton of time this last semester utilizing this platform in this manner. Another community member added, my colleague uses it to create practice questions for stats, just plugs in a topic and picks a few of the several generated uh, questions and in 20 minutes or so has a very well done quiz. Again, always align, uh, always make sure it aligns with what was taught, but certainly cuts down on test and quiz creation. Also can be used to create specific vignettes to use for short essays. Another community member added, I've used ChatGPT to come up with semi-creative titles and announcements. Another added, I've used ChatGPT to help me organize my feedback. Being able to talk through my feedback and then edit it really streamlines my time. My sense is that this community member is simply using ChatGPT as an editor to organize the community member's thoughts. But I want to take this moment to point out that we probably shouldn't be uploading students' work to ChatGPT unless we have students' permission to do so. Similarly, quite recently, the National Science Foundation published their policy on the use of generative artificial intelligence technology in the NSF merit review process, and they too said um, to their reviewers that NSF reviewers are re prohibited from uploading any content from proposals, review information, and related records to non-approved generative AI tools. Note that non-approved part. So clearly they are also using AI, generative AI tools, just somewhere else in the sausage making. Turning to students, how are they using ChatGPT? Or better put, how can we scaffold their use of ChatGPT? My sense from observing, from a year of observing my instructor colleagues is that they've taken roughly three stances. Pretend, <laughs> prohibit, or prepare. Some of my colleagues have pretended that ChatGPT and other AI models simply don't exist, and we certainly can pretend that it's the year 2020, and only students who can afford to do so can get course-related help from Chegg and Course Hero and Slatter and other proprietary sources, which reminds me of this set of tweets. Uh, first from Elizabeth S.B. Cohen, has anyone figured out which line of work the people currently paid to write student essays will take up now that ChatGPT has entered the market? And what of those sites with exam and assignment question banks, to which Sunayan Akara replied, maybe they can check the responses generated by ChatGPT for accuracy and make corrections where necessary until we have check GPT, which will take over those tasks as well. Or we can pretend that it's 1990, pre-internet, and only more privileged students can access course help via well-established test banks and term paper banks notoriously found at sorority and fraternity houses. Or we can pretend that it's 1960 and only more privileged students can access encyclopedic knowledge through their parent purchased and home stored sets of the World Book Encyclopedia or Encyclopedia Britannica. I'm not here to shame anyone's pedagogical choices. 
In fact, recently I had the privilege of keynoting the 2023 Psych Terms Conference with terms standing for Teaching to Enhance Research Methods in Statistics and Psychology. Some of you might be familiar with this conference. It was founded by seven teaching track faculty, each at a different University of California campus, who felt isolated at their home R1 campuses. So they bonded together, and one offshoot of their collaboration is the annual Psych Terms Conference. For any of you who teach methods or stats, you might want to look into attending the conference. I think you might enjoy it, it's usually in the fall. What I liked was that each day of the two-day conference, the organized shared, organizers shared the following preamble. There is no single solution for all instruction, nor is there a single secret sauce that's guaranteed to create a meaningful learning, create meaningful learning for all students. We each bring our own lens here to the teaching experience. We're here to share ideas and experiences and find ingredients to add to our own secret sauce. We're here to support each other as we strive to create a more just and equitable experience for ourselves and our students. And I feel the same way with regard to how to deal with students using ChatGPT. There's no single solution for all instruction. There's no secret sauce. There's nothing that's guaranteed to work for all students. In other words, your mileage may vary. And pretending that it's still 2022 might work for you, and if so, that's great. As for me, I resonate a lot with what Richard Landers from the University of Minnesota wrote on the STP listserv. Landers, by the way, has fantastic data sets available for others to use in their research methods and stats course. But back to the STP listserv, Landers wrote, as long ago as last March, might as well be a decade in AI years, a Forbes article discussed a study of 1,000 undergrad and grad students finding that 43% of college students had tried ChatGPT or other AI tools to complete their work. I suspect that number is significantly higher now. In polls of my classes, it's been closer to 80%. Almost everyone is using ChatGPT 3.5, the free one, which is far less capable than 4.0. Once 4.0 becomes the free option, this will get a lot more complicated. I agree with Richard. Therefore, I think an ignore or a pretend ChatGPT doesn't exist might not be your, 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 your best or most fruitful strategy. Another option is to prohibit its use. And you know, you're aware of its existence, but strictly prohibit students from using it throughout the course. National headlines already suggest that strategy is in play for some educators. For example, from the Wall Street Journal this past June, as AI-enabled cheating royals colleges, professors turned to an ancient testing method, and that means oral exams. Why universities should return to oral exams in the AI chat GPT era. That's from the conversation back in April. It was reprinted in Gizmodo. As AI chatbots rise, more educators look to oral exams with high tech twist. And this is from Edge Surge back in October. And the high tech twist was to conduct the one on one oral exams via Zoom. I don't know what size courses these instructors have, but with my 200 student courses, my eyes are just spinning at the thought of holding 200 one-on-one -on -one oral exams via Zoom. Although, as another headline promised, one can create those oral exams using an AI chatbot. The, prohib the prohibition approach is illustrated by one of my good friends and colleagues who posted the following on Facebook. Today I gave a final exam. After I handed out the exams, one of my best students raised her hand and asked, I'm sorry, professor, but could you explain how to use this? I've never taken an exam using a blue book before. This approach reminds me of 400 BC and Socrates, who espoused that students should only be assessed on content that they have memorized. And according to Socrates, only memorized information is learned, which is a position 
most educators disagree with in current day. Of course, the only reason we in current day know Socrates' opinion on this issue is because Plato used that newfangled technology called writing to record it for posterity. And the only way that I could share with you today an image of Socrates is because I used that newfangled technology called the internet to search Wikimedia for an image. If I was left to draw Socrates from memory, we'd all be in trouble. As a coda to my colleague's blue book anecdote, she reported ChatGPT scored 88 out of 100 on my final exam. I thought it was a difficult but fair exam. Half my class beat ChatGPT's score and half did not. So even if students would have relied solely on ChatGPT, they wouldn't have aced the test. What about instead having students quiz or test ChatGPT over the course material, and then students use their own knowledge, perhaps not just their memorized knowledge, but their own body of knowledge to grade ChatGPT's performance. This approach is similar to what I do in my course. But first, I prepare the students with a four-step approach. First step, I require all students to become familiar with ChatGPT, and I do that for equity and access, because I don't want only the more privileged students to be aware of ChatGPT. I just always try to level the playing field. And I achieve this first goal by assigning two recent popular press articles, some funny tweets for entertainment, all of which illustrate ChatGPT's Chat promise, but as well its pitfalls. Step two, I require students to assess ChatGPT's accuracy, and I achieve this by requiring students to ask ChatGPT six UW-Madison-related questions that I designed. For example, who is Bucky Badger, and what does he wear? Or, what are the chairs like on UW-Madison's Memorial Union Terrace? I pre-tested the questions, and I felt pretty confident that ChatGPT's answers would be somewhat correct, but also contain some inaccuracies. And that's been the case over two course sessions with 400 students. For example, ChatGPT usually gets right that Bucky Badger is UW-Madison's mascot, but it most often got wrong what Bucky wears. And it really used to bomb describing the terrace chairs. And any UW-Madison, uh, oh, okay, so you'll have to, go, oh, there you go. See, you know how unique the terrace chairs are, right, Joan? As science communicator Hank Green tweeted a year ago December, ChatGPT is a lot like me in 1998 in that if you ask it a question, it will answer extremely confidently, even if it has no idea what the answer is. Because the primary goal running throughout all my courses, and I suspect all of yours too, is to enable students to develop their critical thinking skills. This exercise manifests that goal. As I tell students, using ChatGPT is just like using a spell checker. You have to use your critical thinking to know, for example, whether the correct usage in that context is Y-O-U-R rather than Y-O-U apostrophe R-E even if spell checker is adamant in giving you that red squiggly line, you have to use your critical thinking. I also designed two of the six questions to illustrate GIGO, meaning garbage in, garbage out. And that means if you ask ChatGPT a question with a false assumption, such as what color hat does Bucky Badger wear? And Joan would know Bucky Badger does not wear a hat. ChatGPT might not correct your false assumptions. In this way, ChatGPT is no different than tapping incorrect numbers into a hand calculator. Garbage in, garbage out. For this coming term, I'm going to add another exercise for assessing ChatGPT's accuracy, and that is requiring students to ask ChatGPT to list a dozen scholarly references, and then requiring students to check the mere existence of those references because, as some of us have learned, ChatGPT, at least the current model, has a tendency to make up citations. Step three, I require students to become familiar with a ChatGPT detector by using one. And I also do this for access, equity, and access. 
Again, I don't want just the more privileged students to know that chat GPT detectors exist and some instructors might be using them. Having said that, I do not underscore, do not underscore, do not recommend that any instructor use detectors. They are, at least in current day, very unreliable. But I do want my students to be aware of them. And so what I do is I have students copy and paste into a chat GPT detector one of their own completed assignments and then a chat GPT completed assignment and then run it through. And so far, the, the uh, false positive and negative rate has been really good, meaning perfect detection and perfect rejection. But again, I know that's not the case for all detectors, and so be very, very uh, leery of them. Lastly, I require all students to commit to a chat GPT course policy, and that is that they can use chat GPT in my classes, but they need to tell me whenever they use it, and they need to tell me how they used it. And I do this for transparency which is why the Committee on Publication Ethics, along with many journals, including the esteemed Journal of the American Medical Association, also now require journal article authors to identify when and how they've used an AI model, like ChatGPT, in their scholarly articles. I note that, to my knowledge, no journal has banned the use of ChatGPT, but they simply required authors to identify when and how they used it. Although they have banned ChatGPT from being listed as an author, which makes sense to me. Before closing, I want to share one more tweet. This one from Aaron Levy, entrepreneur, co-founder, and CEO of the cloud storage box, which I think many of us use. The introduction of ChatGPT is one of those rare moments in technology where you see a glimmer of how everything is going to be different going forward. And I believe that is so true. So thank you for your attention today. Steve says we have time for questions and discussion. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. So one follow-up question to having students report to you how they use ChatGPT in their assignment. So what do you do, or what should we do <laughs> with that policy if what the student says is, I used it to write the entire thing? <laughs> Thank, you gave me a great entry because there was a part of my presentation that I wasn't able to work in, in to fit the 45 minutes. So you have just now get, opened the door for me to do that. So thank you. Um, I also recommend doing an inventory of one's assignments. And I happen to uh, have, in my Psychological Effects of the Internet course, a really talented undergraduate who was just gaga about chat GPT. So I enrolled him as an independent study student for one semester. He went through, many of you know, I have like a lot of assignments. He went through all 84 assignments in my Psychological Effects of the Internet course, all 84 assignments in my Research Methods course, all 70 assignments in my Basic Stats course. And he's someone who has the paid version. He has all these plugins. I mean, he is just a chat GPT wizard. And he basically flagged for me which assignments chat GPT could do and do pretty easily, and which ones it couldn't. And for most of the basic stats assignments, he said, it's just not worth the effort. By the time I, I yeah, I could tweak it, I could, I could spend four hours, blah, 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 blah. It's just easier to read your instructions and do the assignment, which was gratifying. But there were some assignments that he said, yep, piece of cake, easy for me to do. And I was trying to analyze and get a, a, you know, a big picture of what the assignments were. My first hypothesis would be that it would be, they would map onto like Bloom's taxonomy, right? And so that the low level just spit back out, you know, kinds of things. And that part is true. 
I use in my basic stats and research methods course a prompt of explaining your own words. Piece of cake for chat GPT, okay? Um, so that part is true, but it isn't really the case that the more sophisticated and um, uh, complex uh, the assignment, the, the more difficult it is for chat GPT. So I don't, I confess, maybe that's why I didn't work it in my presentation, I still don't have a handle on which ones, which assignments chat GPT can just ace and do the whole thing and which ones they can't, but at least I'm aware of what, of the case. I want to also tell you something that really saddened me, which is that one of my favorite prompts is to, it, when a student learns some information like reliability and validity or you know, confirmation bias, is to teach it to two other people. But you know, this is the, the old, you don't really know something well until you can teach it to someone else. And believe it or not, ChatGPT can do that assignment because it just BSs its way through it. So it says, yes, I taught this to Maria. And, you know, and so I often say, teach it to the person, ask them for their examples, blah, blah, blah. And her examples were, so it just BSs its way through it. And that saddens me because that is one of my favorite prompts. Having said that, one of the things that I've started doing when I, because I don't want to give up that prompt, is that I ask students to, because um, these are online courses, to send a selfie or a screenshot or something that shows the training process. Also, when I think about it, you know, any student who would kind of go to the trouble or would be okay ethically with ChatGPT just BSing its way, they probably have other problems, you know. <laughs> there are probably bigger problems in this course th that I'm not gonna deal with. So in answer to your question about doing the whole thing, I think doing an inventory, if at all possible, Get, a, get, get a, a graduate student or an undergraduate who really wants to see what chat GPT is about and have them work through and do all your assignments and see, is it even possible to do that? And, and if so, you might want to tweak your assignment. You might want to do it a different way. You might want to prohibit. I mean, again, I'm, I'm not here to value judge anyone. Thanks for the great question. I know that we are at the very end of a very long week, so. Yeah, thanks so much, this is very eye-opening. And this probably isn't a question for you, but given that it's got eight bazillion words in its inventory, why does it make stuff up? Why does it make up <laughs> references? I, I had occasion to ask it what the hundredth digit of pi was. Um, and I asked it twice, and it came up with two different answers each time. Yeah. So uh, do, you, do you know why? Yeah, it's interesting about that. Um, well, it's not a dictionary. It really is a prediction. It is a prediction model. And um, it's kind of like, I mean, this is maybe not satisfactory, but I use um, on my text messages, I use, you know, occasionally I look down and um, use the built-in responses. Okay, I use them a lot. Let me just say, I use them a lot because I'm, I'm usually trying to do too many things. But it's not always the same set of answers. And sometimes they really do fit the context, but sometimes they don't fit the context. And so I think it's just based on prediction. Or another good example is Netflix. I mean, you know, it's just when Netflix give you, you know, because you liked X and Y and Z, you might like this. It's predicting. It's not necessarily a dictionary or an encyclopedia that it's drawing information on. Maybe one day it'll marry a dictionary or an encyclopedia. It'll be more precise. But right now it is still just a prediction model, like predictive text or recommendations or the like. Thank you. No, that's not a good idea. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you. That was really helpful talk, and I especially liked a lot of concrete examples that you gave. Uh, but you do a lot in your class or your classes if you use the same approach in all of them. And I was wondering if you 
wanted to give advice to someone who's like, I just want to get started with one piece, what would you advise? Like, what's the piece you think could be pulled out and isolated that would be most useful? Sure. That's great. I th thank you. That's a wonderful question. I think, back to the question that was just asked, I think uh, introducing students to chat GPT, but also its inaccuracies is paramount because it's critical thinking. And uh, so that students, again, leveling the playing field, but in addition to leveling the playing field, you know, providing that critical thinking training. I mean, the same is true. I mean, I've seen the whole progression of Wikipedia. Remember Wikipedia in the early days? And now, I mean, there are data showing, there are papers published in Nature showing that Wikipedia is as accurate as textbooks. That's not to say it's 100% accurate, but it's as accurate as, you know, <laughs> textbooks might not be either. I can't say that looking in this direction. <laughs> textbook authors, textbook, I, I know your textbooks are accurate, but that's, you know? Or encyclopedia. I mean, I grew up with great, you know, I used to go to my neighbor's house because they had the, you know, the, the encyclopedias and I could do my homework there. And I always assume, oh yeah, if it's in the encyclopedia, it's going to be accurate. I think that's one of the critical pieces is, I um, mean, you might do it with like the kind of funny thing that I did like with Bucky, ba I mean, Bucky Badger or things like that. You might do it with the kinds of answers that you, that you were talking about that seem to come up, you know, um, you know, kind of, uh, ir not irrationally, but you know, not consistently. I think that's the most important piece because I think otherwise we do feel like, again, it's in the textbook, it's in Wikipedia, it's in encyclopedia, it's gotta be correct. And ChatGPT is no different. I hope that's helpful. I also hope at least you have a little bit of a background and maybe you're not as anxious about it. Coming, coming a year from now, we'll see how people are feeling. So thank you again so much.